Poverty and hunger affect countless people across the world, preventing them from supporting themselves and their families. Often linked, many struggle to afford the food they need to sustain themselves or go without to feed their children, leading to numerous issues throughout their lives. Everyone should reach their fullest potential, but how? We've invited three experts who seek to highlight ways we can help those in need. They are Dr. Ginesh Cheruparambal, a consultant with Tatva ESG Solutions, Martin Drury, the CEO of Health Poverty Action, and Michelle Shaw, the head of projects for Aquat. After their presentations, they kindly took questions from the audience. Before we start with the Q&A session, I'd like to thank our speakers again for sharing their valuable knowledge and experience with us. And I always say, step by step, at drop by drop, we certainly make a big change for a thrivable future. With that, we move on to the first question, which is open to our speakers and anybody, anyone can answer first. So according to our latest report, uh, only 17% of SDG targets are on track to be met by 2030. In your view, what are the leading challenges that are derailing the progress towards SDG 1 and 2? Anyone can answer first. Thank you. I'll quickly start by just adding, and I mentioned this in my presentation as well, I think there's a need uh, for collaboration uh, between the different parts of society that we have. So the public sector, the private sector, as well as the civil society. I think problems such as humongous as poverty or zero hunger cannot be you know, solved in silos. What we can do is learn from the models that are working um, and then, you know, carry forward those approaches and make them implement them in more localized settings. Right. So what might work for me over here in Pakistan might not work in the UK, but there it needs to be some point in which we can start. So I do think that there is a need for more collaboration between the different people working, you know, in these fields to be able to achieve the sustainable development goals. Right. Thank you. Yeah, Ganesh. Yeah, in my view, when I <clears throat> look at this uh, attainment of any of the SDGs, what I have observed is this from uh, 2016 onwards, if you look at uh, the whole, from an economic perspective, <clears throat> 2016 onwards, the from Brexit onwards, more of an economic polarization is happening everywhere. So we need more of a collaboration, as Michel said, from an international economic perspective, which is not happening if you look at the bio, uh, even the political scenarios everywhere. So that, of course, will take away so much of fund and capital from each economy. And also, if you look at after a certain few years back after the pandemic, the climate change, which has caused damage to the economies, so much of spending on that itself is happening. So I don't, these could be the forces which might have taken away obviously from economies, so much of capital. That is what I think. Yeah, yeah I, I think poverty in the, the final analysis isn't so much about lack of wealth as lack of power. And I, I think one of the things that we focus on, um, obviously you've got to focus on the what, you know, what needs to, what is happening, what progress are we making? But I think we need if in anything, an almost bigger focus on the why. So, you know, why is, is is change not happening? What are the blocks? And that brings me back, one of the reasons that I mentioned that framing things about inequality so much, is that if we just focus on the targets about the poorest, it makes it all about the poor. And that's not where the causation lies. That's not where, therefore, that's not where the solution lies, really. That voice is important. But you need to also focus on where power lies and uh, and how power has been used. Uh, so you need to focus on the rich as well as the poor. You need to look at the whole picture. Um, I think that's part of the key to unlocking the blocks to progress. Right. Uh, I do understand that. And thank you for sharing your views on that. Now, before we move ahead, uh, just before asking for the questions, I'd like to ask our audience to drop in their question in the chat. And while doing so, please remember to mention your name, location, and email address so that we can connect with you after the webinar gets over. So during the closing segment, we will announce the best question asked. So do remember to uh, uh, put your questions in the chat. Thank you. Now, moving on to the uh, specific questions. Uh, first question is for Ganesh. 
could you please discuss about some technology advancements which are which can help in controlling the illicit financial flows to give you an example uh, i know about india the the unified payment interface it is helping in avoiding spillages helping in 100% direct uh, benefit transfers in urban as well as rural areas your take thanks so when we look at the broader illicit financial flows it's between the countries so it is happening between the countries or even if one company operates in one country they do have an affiliation in the other country and they transfer money over two countries and might be the profit is being shared and where they are present at the tax havens they are evading tax from uh, taking money over the other so this is what basically happens with the illicit financial flows now Ghana has tried in place a somewhat of a tax system where they have made most of the things on uh, making online like a sort of a blockchain i i don't know whether i i am not in a expert to say it is exactly the blockchain but the something of similar which they have introduced which have to a larger extent curb this illicit financial flows and they could track it and if you look at the history of Ghana they had so much of uh, economic problems troubles and so much of uh, illicit flows which was happening in Ghana and they could curb it but it needs an international cooperation because if the money is being going to the other and they if the government asks for that the data has to be revealed and they need some sort of international transparency in financial transactions that is something which has to happen for that i don't know how this could be resolved probably a blockchain which is accepted from imf point of view or anything of that sort can work out otherwise still i don't have an answer to that because there are if you look at uh, this uh, trade misinvoicing there are a n number of ways because recently i came across a news saying i read a piece of news regarding this one itself a, a luxury car which is being stolen in canada it is being found out back some of in sudan or somewhere it never happens like that so but uh, this sort of illicit flows can bring things like that so obviously it depends on not just one country the country in which the countries are trading so cooperation of other different countries also matters a lot in this regard so that yeah, is what the really answer we think yeah yeah i believe uh, over and above technology it's more about the strong government will that yeah financial be, transparency yeah. yes yeah yeah thank you for sharing your views uh next up is for martin there was a graph which you showed in your presentation which uh, showcased the percentage of people living in extreme poverty and we noticed that there were a couple of trend lines with a spike at the tail end compared to others and uh, so i'm talking specifically about the north and south africa and middle east so according to you what could be the reason for such a spike the hard one to answer uh, succinctly <laughs> the, but the big and the single biggest uh spike that where, where the, the global uh trend is different to where it is anywhere else is in africa and i i think um you know there are a lot of different reasons for that. and of course it's different in different parts of africa particularly sub saharan africa and a lot of it comes down to the just uh, to power relationships so in um the and a lot of that links back to colonialism um and sorry this is going to be a really rather, uh, uh, disjointed answer but I, I i think one of the things that the, uh, the colonial history in africa did um you know my country is one of the the worst to blame is um it actually increased power imbalance and inequality um uh, both in both the north and the south so it then enriched that you it created elites in african countries and it created elites in um in the in the uk and and that you therefore have um uh, increasing difficulty of uh those without the wealth to hold power to account uh, and i i think the um the underfunding of governance and and the the underfunding of a public sector um is is one of the driving uh, 
uh, factors, uh, particularly in Africa, that prevents progress in SDGs. Now, that's partly because of the starvation of, of revenue, because of uh, illicit financial flows, uh, tax dodging, um, uh, conflict, you know, uh, uh, in imbalances of power fueling conflict, uh, which again uh, consumes resources, weakens governance. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, poverty drives poverty, but I think. It, um, so I think I think those are some of the factors, but I think ultimately we need to look at uh, the causes of inequality and the imbalances of power and look at ways of addressing those. If power is more equally shared, people have voices at the United Nations, people have voices in international fora, they're represented. That reduces a lot of the drives uh, that prevent progress in the SDGs, I think. Right. If, uh, if I may to add on to this. And I stand corrected. I think specifically, specifically for North South Africa, uh, there has been a lot of unrest, the civil wars that have been a contributor to a lot of distress that people have right now. I mean, in their family, in their life. So yeah, I mean, I believe that is also one of these contributing factors where people are living in so much extreme poverty. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Uh, my next question is for Michal. Uh, your organization runs so many programs targeting people who are in desperate need of support. So what are the challenges you as an organization face while working with socially and economically marginalized families? Thank you, Dr. Karan. So um, we often uh, get this question a lot and we always say that every challenge is an opportunity, right? So we don't look at it as a challenge and get disappointed by it. But um, in order to answer your question, I think when we initially started in 2001, we had a lot of, um, you know, it was difficult for us to convince uh, people in Pakistan, be it our donors or our beneficiaries, that, you know, this model is going to work, right? Because they were like, you're giving interest-free loans, you're, there's no collateral whatsoever. These are uh, people who are extremely underprivileged. They are not going to repay you back right so i think the hardest uh, part uh, the biggest challenge was to win over that trust and that credibility that no this is a model that it is, that is going to work so i think that was one of our main challenges that we had and of course with any development organization i think because we have now expanded from microfinance to education and you know if it was up to us we'd want to solve all the problems right but we then do have a lack of resources available of course um, given that the amount of you know inundated we get inundated with applications for example whenever we're opening our applications for our educational programs but we can't cater to each and every individual right so at times there is you know a lack of resources so we have to prioritize you know what do we want to focus on so for that reason you know uh, we also often ask that you know what is a fourth succession plan what are you going to do um, you know, in the next 10 years. And our focus for that reason is education, is our students, because we're inculcating in them the philosophy that I spoke about earlier, the philosophy of solidarity and brotherhood, with that hope that they are going to carry forward the message of a khuat. And that doesn't mean that they have to come back and work for us, but that means that they can start their own khuat or their own kind of development organization to kind of carry forward this message. Because the more the mayor, um, I think the problem is just so large that we need more people who are working in this field. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Now, because uh, there is limitation of time and uh, it restricts me to ask any further questions, uh, I'll quickly squeeze in a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, so my first question is uh, to Michal. What are your future plans as an organization going forward? I mean, you have so many uh, programs that you run for different communities, different kind of people. So any further new programs that are coming up to accelerate your success? Uh, so I think we already have a lot of programs that are running. Uh, the focus now will be on expanding the network of these programs. Um, so even within our microfinance network, we are, do have a presence in 400 cities across Pakistan, but we want to expand our presence even more. Right, we do. We have made kind of a shift. So initially, the interest fee loans that we gave uh, were primarily for um, business. They were business loans, so they were for those people who wanted to initiate or expand their businesses. But now we're also giving loans for housing, 
and for agriculture, for our livestock. So can, we are an agro, agro-based economy, right? So we want to empower our small skills farmers as well. So there is a shift and a focus on that. And as I mentioned before, we are really want to focus now on education as well, because when you talk about poverty, I think one of the biggest problems we have over here is intergenerational poverty. And I think mm-hmm. without uh, working in the field of education or providing education to the children of those families, you can't really, um, you know, you can't really picture them being able to step out of the, this problem that they've been enduring for years and years. So those are our two main focuses uh, for now, but I think education is one of the key ones. Right. I do understand. And I do second the thought that education is very important to educate people of understanding what are these issues and how to deal with them going forward, or, I mean, on their own. Um, next up question is for uh, Kinesh. Countries like USA, UK, Switzerland, and Tax7, how can they be engaged in stopping the money coming in? So most of the IFF flows, what we observed is towards the developing countries. Now, when we look at uh, this U, uh, USA, UK, and what we can uh, suggest is like uh, anti-money laundering laws has to be enforced in a very strict format. And enforce something like a beneficial ownership transparency, something so that where it goes and for what purpose it is being used mm-hmm. can be tracked, which is in way gives the linkage between the transaction between two countries or multiple countries, which in a way can identify why it has been moved. And of course, improve international tax corporations. This is what mostly these countries can do uh, to help others. And yeah, probably look for an, a global and the IFF initiatives. That is something which is still happening, not that happened. So somebody, I, I think in the GFI, they have suggested, but it needs uh, the ac- acceptance from quite many economies. So that is what which they can do. Basically, if they enforce the, like the beneficially ownership transparency, then it can help a lot. In Quebec, that is the best thing to do. Yeah. I'll quickly squeeze in one question for Martin. Uh, so. According to you, what are the driving forces in a society which can help organizations like yours to succeed in their mission of eradicating poverty? The question to end with. Um, I, I, I'll tell you one, one of the things. I, I think one of the challenges we have is that some of the most important factors that drive poverty, like illicit financial flows, for example, aren't accessible to the majority of the people affected by it because of the, they're shrouded in complexity. And there was a, a really powerful global campaign around the millennium that was uh, about cancelling poor countries' debts in order to, uh, international debt, in order to free up uh, revenue to be spent on healthcare and, and, and education and so forth. And the general perception in advance of that was that international debt, debt between countries, was just too complicated a concept to mount a really popular grassroots public campaign on. And accepting that challenge and making it a single issue, a focus, sustained focus for a few years, educating people about it, because it's not that uh, difficult a concept to grasp. You know, if you're paying money back to uh, IMF or World Bank, you can't put money into education system. So let's cancel that debt and instead educate the uh, give people healthcare and education. Making that making visible in a in a uh, educating public education making those sh- shining a light on the injustice changes the power balance around it and I, so i think there's a chance for all of us issues like illicit financial flows anything that is at the moment not uh, causing uh, poverty but that is is hidden educate it make it the information accessible shine a light on it and i think there's great power in that Thank you. Uh, and I do agree on that. We are running short of time and this restricts me to ask any further questions. But I would request our speakers to answer the remaining questions offline. And for our viewers, do sign up our newsletter and get access to these Q&As and latest updates. And do remember to 
join us in our next webinar, which is on 19th November 2024, which is based on uh, SDG 7, Affordable and Clean Energy Science and Technology. With that, uh, thank you very much.